Let me read to you a passage from the sixth chapter of St. Luke's Gospel, verses 1 to 5. It's the Gospel for Saturday of the 22nd week in ordinary time. St. Luke writes, One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the cornfields, and his disciples began to pick some ears of corn, rub them in their hands, and to eat the grain. Some of the Pharisees asked, Why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Jesus answered them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and taking the consecrated bread, he ate what is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. That's from Luke chapter 6, verses 1 to 5. What does this suggest to us? Well, you know, in modern times we take the five or six day working week so much for granted that we forget what a radical, con radical concept a day of rest was in ancient times. The weekly day of rest had no exact parallel in any other ancient civilization. Leisure was for the wealthy and the ruling classes, and never for the serving or labouring classes. The idea of a religious rest day each week was unimaginable. I have read a reference to Juvenal and Seneca calling the Sabbath an example of Jewish indolence. Ancient Egypt had numerous feasts, but not a regular Sabbath. It is to be noted that among the Ten Commandments, that pivotal charter for the living of revealed religion, the Sabbath is the one command involving a specific religious observance. The Sabbath observances thus holds rank with the other Nine Commandments. Moreover, it even found an important place in the first account of creation, the first chapter of Genesis. God is portrayed there as resting at the end of his working week. His people are pleasing to God if they do likewise then. Not only was the Sabbath observance pivotal in the practice of revealed religion, but it has been a major inheritance of Israel to the world. Though its sanctity is largely lost, the idea of the Sabbath rest at the end of the week is accepted everywhere. Even the word a sabbatical is in common use. I say this to introduce the critical position of the Sabbath in the religious life of Israel in our Lord's time, and the sensitive question of how man was to take his religious rest on that day, how it was to be observed. The Pharisees and their school had developed an elaborate system that in their view protected the Sabbath and ensured its fundamental place. Christ disregarded many of their regulations as extreme and showed that in their zeal for their own religious customs they had quite forgotten the weightier matters of the divine law. So there was a direct collision between the dominant religious, religious party of the day and our Lord and a principal issue was the observance of the Sabbath. Jesus sovereignly set aside many of their prescriptions on how this fourth commandment was to be observed. It was becoming increasingly a question of authority, whose authority was supreme. The Gospel I've read a few minutes ago from Luke chapter 6 verses 1 to 5 presents one occasion of this conflict. The disciples are spotted picking ears of corn on the Sabbath day and the scribes and Pharisees bring forward their complaint. Jesus' disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. It is not, Christ replied, it is not unlawful, and he cited the practice of David. He is pointing to the scriptures and proving the correctness of his interpretation of the Sabbath. But he does more, he does more than show that he is a much greater interpreter of the Sabbath. He is the Sabbath's Lord. Now, this is an astonishing remark and it was made calmly in the presence of his enemies who were determined to catch him out in his words. 
No prophet had ever said such a thing. It would have been preposterous to have suggested that Moses made such a claim. The Sabbath was the Lord's day, and here was someone stating that he himself was the Lord of the Sabbath. Who was the Lord of the Sabbath but the Lord God of Israel? While at his trial before the Sanhedrin, our Lord claimed to be divine and was put to death for it, he also made similar claims during his public ministry. We read of his being accosted by the religious authorities and at their questioning, making the plainest of claims. I and the Father are one, he said to them. The Father works, so I work, he said again. Before Abraham ever was, I am. Here in our Gospel passage, he speaks thus again. I am the Lord of the Sabbath. It is, in effect, yet another allusion to his divinity. He cannot be reduced to yet another religious authority that competes with the authority of the scribes and Pharisees. He is unique and he transcends all. Let our reading of this passage prompt us once again to acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord, Lord of the Sabbath and Lord of all. Let us also note that in Christ's answer to the religious authorities, he accepts the Sabbath. So let us truly accept it too. We ought to ask ourselves how we sanctify the Sunday. Is it a mere day of secular rest and recreation, or does it have an active religious dimension? Is it a day given to the Lord, and only in the Lord a day of rest? In the Old Testament, God commands his people to be holy, for he is holy. Leviticus chapter 11 verse 14. It is a command repeated by St. Peter in his letter. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 15. Be holy in all your conduct, he writes. The church has insisted constantly on the gravity of the Sabbath observance, which the Christian marks on the Sunday, the day of the Lord's resurrection. Let us receive the baton of sanctity then and run with it, resolving to make the observance of the Sabbath a fundamental feature of our Christian life, in which we acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord.